Okay, this will be uh, part two. What I'd like to do is kind of break this down into, into decades. I think uh, that'll be easier for me to remember. And what I'll be talking about now is the 60s. I'll try and talk about things as it relates to my personal life, my family, and then history as well. But um, I don't remember much of the 50s. Uh, probably most of my memories come from pictures or stories that were told. We, I was born in Kansas City, moved to Kentucky. Uh, from there, though, we, uh, we were transferred to Fairchild Air Force Base uh, just outside of Spokane, Washington. And I can remember taking the uh, trip in an old car that uh, had a little cable in the back. My parents had put uh, down a suitcase between the front seat and the back seat so that I had a big, huge flat area that I could kind of roam, romp around in um, for, that, for that trip. Um, I can remember it was, I don't know how many days it would have taken to have driven that back then with the cars that they had and the mileage and whatnot, but I remember it was a long trip. I remember going through Chicago on a very hot day. It was supposed to be over 100 degrees and Chicago was easily the biggest city I'd ever seen. We ended up uh, then going through North Dakota and South Dakota, or North Dakota and Montana. And I remember always looking straight ahead. The road was dead straight, two lane road, not much on either side. I do remember driving through Helena, Montana, which was uh, which was an interesting city to me for some reason. It uh, had that old fashioned look with with brick um, storefronts on it and uh, uh, brick capped and stuff on top. But what stuck out in my mind was I was shocked at how um, clean it was and I, I don't know why that would surprise you know a four or five year old boy but it was really really shocking to me at that time um, and our, our trip continued and when we got probably to pretty close to the Idaho border I remember seeing all those big beautiful pine trees and there was a place called Frontierland and I remember because we took a picture of us stopping at Frontierland because they had a bear uh, along the road to attract people and you would uh, basically the, the bear's jaws would open or and it would have a had a stereo recording of a bear growling and that just stood out in my mind but that and the big 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 pine trees but we ended up making it to um, Spokane and uh, Spokane was the place where my mom's family lived we would visit uh, Aunt June, Uncle Joe, Aunt Dorothy and Uncle Andy and their kids, uh, Hooper and Dale, uh, those were those were my cousins at the time. I've been told often that they were very mean to me. I was the youngest. They would kind of pick on me amongst all of us boys. Um, I don't know if I deserved it or not. I might have, <laughs> from what I can recollect. Um, but we, we were there in Spokane, and because of my dad's rank, we couldn't live on base at that point. So uh, we had to... Uh, lived somewhere off base. I don't, I don't know quite where it was or how long we lived there. I think it was actually quite a while, but um, we ended up moving to a, an area called New Garden that is now a botanical garden outside of Spokane on the way to Fairchild Air Force Base. And I've actually been there even in the last few years or so. And the house that we lived in is uh, still there. Um, uh, probably most of my first real clear recollection start living in the new, new in the new garden area um, I remember uh, learning how to ride my bike there uh, we lived kind of up on a hill um, where our small little house was and uh, I remember um, riding down the hill with my training wheels I remember having the training wheels taken off and I did basically the same thing and rode to the bottom of the hill and crashed and got all scuffed up like most kids tend to do when you're when you're <laughs> learning how to ride without training wheels. Um, I can remember in that house uh, I played with matches and went into my mom's uh, closet just playing with matches and got a mink coat that my dad had given her as an anniversary present on fire and uh, for some reason I remember the ironing board that was covered with cloth caught on fire too because we had that ironing board the rest of my life at home and it's always had the same cloth that had burn marks on it so I guess I never forgot that particular incident. We also as kids we'd r always run off we were always in the woods I can remember uh, walking through the woods and up in Washington it's always very moist and humid a lot of different smells and uh, I can remember walking through the woods and there'd be one smell I detect at times and I always felt like it was a snake 
or there's a snake nearby. And to this day, when I when I come across that that mildewy smell, I always I don't think I have fear, but I always think of big snakes. And uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. When I was there, also as kids, we went out in some big grass field, and there was an old abandoned wooden cart. And uh, we would pick up that cart, the tongue of the cart, and if the kids would pick up, three or four kids would pick up the tongue, and if you were sitting on the, the, the upper side, the kid that was sitting up there would slide down, kind of like a self-made slide. And I can remember I decided to go down the other side, which had not been used or slicked off, and I got on it, they picked it up, I slid down, and there was a protruding nail, and it ripped open my stomach, and uh, to this day, I still have that uh, that childhood scar, like all, all kids tend to pick up scars. Another story I had was uh, somebody called my mom frantically saying that I was walking on a railing above the highway on a new bridge that they had built. And uh, I, can, I don't remember doing that, but I can remember being home and her being very mad at me for having done that. Um, so anyway, that was uh, kind of what our what our experience was on uh, uh, in, in that area. But I think my, my dad uh, improved in rank and that meant that we could move on base. And moving on base was fun. Uh, being a military brat, part of a military family was uh, incredibly fun. Um, you know, it's kind of self-contained. You have your own schools. You have a, something called a base exchange um, there where you can go in and shop for things at discount. You wouldn't have to go off base. The base was protected with fencing. They had uh, military police that would patrol. And uh, we, we lived in a pretty nice house, actually. I remember it had an unfinished basement, but we had a park that was in front of us. And I would go out and fly kites. I can remember making the tails for my kites and trying to get kites so high that you couldn't see them in the air. Uh, and it seemed like the longer the tail, the higher they would fly for some reason. And I would have a tail that might be 20 feet long. And uh, we used real light, light material and we would tie it together and have that really long, long tail. In that same field, we'd go out with these glass mason jars and uh, collect bumblebees or grasshoppers and uh, close the cap over the top of them and shake them up. And those poor bees, those poor grasshoppers, we were, we were brutal to them at the time. Also, when we lived there, I remember my sister Wendy was born in Spokane, and uh, when we got on base, she was old enough. Uh, I remember we got up one morning. She must have been over one because she was walking, but the front door was open. She'd gotten up and out somehow and was walking outside in the middle of a snowstorm, and we don't know how long she had been out there. It could have been hours, but uh, we rushed around, and I don't quite remember who or how somebody found her, but they found her a ways away. I know that it was a long enough search that we called the military police. Um, and uh, we got Wendy back, so fortunately she's still with us today. Um, Spokane was a fun place because we did spend a lot of time with mom's family. We'd spend holidays there. I can remember uh, going over to Uncle Andy and Aunt Dorothy's house. Aunt Dorothy is the only surviving right now, living sister of the nine kids that the Northfits had. And uh, I remember going over to her house that she still lives in today, that I was in just a few months ago, actually. And um, uh, on our way there, I remember there was a red light in the sky, and uh, my, my parents told me that uh, that was Santa Claus. And I was pretty excited. Went and uh, told that to my cousins, uh, Hooper and Dale. And they told me that Santa Claus wasn't real. Uh, I remember in that basement, the ceiling was made out of egg cartons. So you had a bumpy, bumpy ceiling, but it was kind of cool. It might still be that way, I don't know. Just interesting, the, the memories that you'll have from your, from your childhood. But living on a base was, again, it was fantastic. Uh, I remember those big B-52 bombers coming in, huge planes, huge. They'd come in, big barreling black smoke coming out of the back of the out of the back of the plane. Uh, it was it was so cool to see. And we saw the Blue Angels came to give a, a 
a flight demonstration and as a little kid to see them fly in formation and take off and hear the rumbling jet engines and uh, see them crisscrossing and that was that was an incredible time. I remember uh, kindergarten. I remember um, my parents having to worry about me because the parents said I was hyperactive. And they, I remember them talking about some kind of medication. I don't think I ever took it, but I can remember that uh, that's what had gone on there. Another memory I have is it was Easter. I can remember going to an Easter egg hunt, and the field that was kind of sloped was full of eggs and had these big trees. But we were told that there were some golden eggs that had a prize in them. And I can remember wanting to find that, and I rushed out on the trees, and pretty soon, somehow, my dad walked up to me and kind of kicked his, pointed his foot at something, and I looked down, it was a golden egg. So I remember I got that golden egg and it had a buck in it. <laughs> I remember my dad helping me out with that. He did years later in Boy Scout camp, giving me an extra hot dog, which maybe I'll tell you a little bit more about later on. But um, anyway, we, we had, it was a good time in, in Washington. Um, Last little story is I remember uh, going hunting with my dad and Uncle Andy up in the mountains. My cousins went with me as well, and uh, we set up these, these glass bottles to practice shooting at. And I remember one of the bottles was a big gallon jar. The other ones were kind of small. And I was the youngest, so I got the first shot. So I aimed, and I shot the, the big jar, and I remember my cousin Hooper just broke down, started crying because he wanted to, he wanted to shoot that big jar. I probably didn't know. I just said, "Well, I'm going to shoot that big jar." But I can remember his uh, his breakdown because I had shot that big jar, and uh, obviously we didn't get a bear. I probably would have remembered that. But we left. Um, my dad was transferred then from. Um, Fairchild Air Force Base to McCoy Air Force Base in Orlando, Florida. We left and drove down to California to see my mom's sister, Aunt Connie, who had, had gotten married to a guy named Joe Foster, Joseph Foster, an older gentleman, very Italian, who had made a, quite a bit of money. He drove a Mercedes, used to gamble a lot. Um, but he made quite a bit of money because he owned Chris's Super Duper Hot Dogs. They were a foot long. When you'd bite into them, they'd snap or crack because that outer coating was, was thick. And um, But he was famous because of the snappy, cracky hot dogs. But he would put chopped up tomatoes and onions and relish on it too, which was unusual back in the 60s. It's not now, but it was then. So uh, it was right across from the Oakland High School, and he made a ton of money. Those high school kids would come over there and buy all those hot dogs, and he was rolling in the in the bundo, I tell you. So remember, it was kind of cool because Aunt Connie and then Uncle Joe, they had a pool. And the pool was a good caliber quality pool, and that was a really unique thing for a young, young kid. I don't know how long we were there, maybe a few days, maybe a week. Then we headed off across America uh, in our uh, air conditionless car. I don't know how we survived that and made it to Orlando, Florida. And we uh, moved into um, temporary housing until we could get on, uh, you know, find a permanent place for ourselves. I remember the house is made out of uh, cinder blocks and had concrete floors. I remember going outside and everything was different. It was hotter, heavier, more humid, more bugs, and you could hear frogs. That was probably the beginning of my frog or something, but um, uh, we'd go out and you'd hear thousands of frogs, and sometimes you'd see them, and they were slick and had sometimes red eyes or, you know, just really curiously looking frogs. More a frog than a, than a toad, actually. And, um, but something I really remember, which is interesting, was getting that first night or two got up. I went up to get, get to the bathroom, and Lights were out on the way to the bathroom. I kept hearing things cracking beneath my feet like I was stepping on broken glass. And turned on the lights, and I'd been stepping all over uh, herds of cockroaches, uh, better known down there as palmetto bugs. Um, they're all over the place. 
I mean, I joked years later, you go into the shower and they'd hand you a bar of soap in your, in your hand towel. <laughs> but they were everywhere. You just had to, had to, learn, to le learn to live with that. But somehow we uh, got into, we bought a house on Luzon Drive there uh, outside of um, Fairchild or M McCoy Air Force Base, which later became the Orlando Airport. When you land on the airport, even some of the buildings there at the Orlando Airport are the old Air Force buildings that they had on that base at the time. We didn't live too far from there. Um, and um, when I was there, that's when they first started developing Disney World. Uh, they had a lot of a lot of that under construction, and it was going to open a few years later. And as uh, I've gone back, as uh, our family's gone back, all the kids and stuff, I always, when we fly in there, I I think about living there. Living on that base was fantastic as well. I remember my uh, dad had um, he always had a second job. Mom always worked. I was kind of a last key kid, and uh, uh, we would go. Uh, in the evenings, and a job he had was, uh, I think he monitored or managed a laundromat, and we would go in, and I could look for coins in all of the washing machines and dryers, and if I found enough, I could go across the street and see, go see a movie at night while my dad was working in the laundromat, which is kind of cool. I remember seeing 20,000 Leagues Beneath the Sea, and the movie, the cartoon movie that Disney put out called The Sword and the Stone. I remember those two, two movies very, very well from that, that experience. They were new at the time. Um, in our house, uh, it was the first home that my mom and dad had bought there. It had a carport. It had three bedrooms, one bath, kitchen, little living room. It was on a big lot. And uh, I remember when we lived there, we always had pets. Dad always had pets for us. He liked animals, and I did too, and we'd always build cages for him and things like that. And uh, I remember I had a bunny rabbit, Dutch, Dutch, big, fat uh, bunny rabbit that uh, I took pretty good care of, but uh, I would feed it, move it around in its cage, keep it in the shade. But one day I ran off, played long enough that when I got back, the sun had... Uh, Shade had moved away, and the rabbit was in in the sun, and it died of died of a heat stroke, and I was pretty pretty torn up by that. Uh, I remember such that I had to find a special shoebox, and I wrapped it in my baby blanket, which for some reason I still had at that time, and, uh, and now was my time to part, and I would I would give that baby blanket to uh, to Dutch. So I remember uh, burying the rabbit, having a little cross, and uh, a real formal thing, but one of the first big losses in my life. Uh, behind our house, we had a canal. It was fun because it had water, and you could get out in the grass and stuff, but as I recollected years later, the canal it had to be a sewage canal because the way it smelled, the yellow water, it stank. Um... I remember walking up a grass trail next to the canal and I looked up and there's this big black coiled snake, probably a cottonmouth. And I was scared and yelled and I think it was scared. And so I turned around and ran and ran down this grass trail and turned around to look and it was slithering after me or didn't know where to go either, you know. So I, I kept running and uh, maybe it was going to bite me. I don't know, but it didn't, obviously. But I can remember always being so scared of of uh, finding a snake down there again. And we would walk in that canal. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, we'd take our shoes and socks off, roll our pants up, and walk in that canal. That filthy water. And uh, we had to watch out for snapping turtles. Snapping turtle would come up and could snap your toe off or your finger. You know, they'd bite it, bite down strong enough, they'd just take, take, your, take your finger off. And uh, it was amazing. Uh, some historical things that happened, though, when I was there, they had the Missile Cuban Crisis. And I can remember being in school and having nuclear disaster drills where we'd have to, the alarm would go off, and we would have to crawl underneath our, our desks to, to, um, to learn how to protect ourselves in the event that Khrushchev, 
uh, set off a missile from Cuba and would it land somewhere in Florida. So, um, so we had those particular drills. Probably the most significant thing though was I was outside riding my brand new Schwinn bike. I love that bike because I had to put batteries in it and it had a little horn. You could push a button and it, was zzz, and it had a little button that you could click and the lights would turn on. And uh, <clears throat> um, the, uh, I can remember that I would attach um, uh, poker playing cards to it with a, uh, with a clothespin. And when you'd go down the road, it would clatter. Clack, 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 clack. And uh, that was kind of cool <laughs> um, to have that sound. But I can remember somebody running up to me saying that John F. Kennedy had been shot. And I went into the house. Mom and Dad weren't there. I was always alone after school until Mom got home from work. And watching on the TV and following the events of uh, not only that day, but in the upcoming days of his death, his funeral, and Lee Harvey Oswald getting, getting shot. Um, I remember the funeral really stood out to me. It was almost eerie to see the president being drawn in that horse-drawn horse, horse -drawn carriage and the one kind of wild black horse that was jumping around and had the boots turned backwards to signify, I guess, death or honor or something like that. But that was, uh, that was quite the... Quite the memory that I had. Uh, that would have been 1963, so I would have been six and a half or seven at that time. Uh, the other thing that happened while we were there was John Glenn was shot into space. It was cool. We were just maybe 100 miles away from Cape Canaveral, it was called. I think now they'd probably call it Cape Kennedy. And I watched John Glenn go into space. It was so neat. To, you could even hear and feel 100 miles away those big jet engines push him up into space in that big white plume until he kind of disappeared into the horizon. And uh, again, that was an exciting thing for a kid. You know, these jets and these rockets and things like that. When we were in Florida, we spent quite a bit of time um, going out fishing. We would fish for catfish. And I remember catching a 100-pound catfish. The Remember, I had a picture, it's long gone, but uh, of the fish that we caught, but Dad had me hold up this 100-pound catfish and I would hold it up and it was taller than me at the time. The fish was up here and its tail was on the ground. Huge, huge catfish. But um, anyway, those were those were pretty pretty good times. I'm going to end it here now uh, in, in Florida. I'll uh, begin the next segment, uh, which would be starting probably in 65 or so uh, when we move up to Kentucky.